please go ahead, Prof. You can share from your side. Okay, good. Right. So I am going to share with you uh, just a, a quick overview of you know, the experiences of dealing with COVID-19. And I'll talk about, you know, over the past year and a bit, some of the good, some of the bad, and some of the complicated. So let's start with, you know, just a quick situation analysis. Where are we in the COVID epidemic? And then go on to the lessons. So if we look at, how did it all begin? Well, it started off on the 30th of December when I received this ProMed alert. And this alert basically shared with the world that there were cases of pneumonia of unknown origin in China, in a city called Wuhan. And that's how it came to the world's attention. And it's quite striking that within a matter of what, 11, 12 days, the sequence of the virus was already made available. And it's, it's a testimony to really the uh, amazing capabilities that were done and that are present in gene sequencing in the facilities there in China. And by the end of that month, the WHO had declared an emergency of international concern, and it took about uh, another five weeks before we had our first case here in South Africa. And then shortly thereafter, a national state of disaster was declared. So where are we right now? Well, we initially, had a rapidly growing epidemic. So when we think back to March of last year, our epidemic was growing quite rapidly, doubling every two days. But because of the quick action that was taken uh, in declaring the state of disaster, in instituting the lockdown, South Africa was able to flatten the curve. Whereas in the UK, they didn't do that. It, it took quite a while longer before the UK instituted its prevention measures. And so you can see how the difference that occurs from action versus inaction in slowing down the spread of the virus. But that flattening of the curve basically meant that South Africa didn't have its first peak in, in April. Instead, we had pushed it back and we knew that as we eased restrictions, as we knew we would have to do, that by June, the cases would start rising. And so that's what happened. We went through our first wave uh, early in the, in the middle of last year. And then we went into a trough of low transmission until we had a situation where students started having parties, and we had a new variant and we went, that led us into our second wave. And the second wave was much more severe because it was driven by a new variant. And this variant spreads faster. So instead of having the slower peak that we saw in the first wave, in the second wave, we had a very sharp peak and a very sharp decline. And of course the emissions rose quite rapidly, putting enormous pressure on the system. And we are now back to a situation of low transmission in our country. We are seeing a bit of an upswing in one or two provinces, and that's small outbreaks that are occurring in the Free State and the Northern Cape, probably driven largely by Easter activities. And you can look at that in terms of the proportion of tests that are positive. So we like to keep this proportion to below five. And you can see we are now, because of these few outbreaks that we have, we are close to that benchmark of 5%. And you can see on the left-hand side that the number of tests that we are doing average per day 
is still quite good, running at around 25,000. So it's not an issue of fewer tests. It's a genuine issue of fewer cases. Now, when you look at it at a provincial level, you get a sense of what I was pointing out earlier, that in places like the Northern Cape and the Free State, because they're not uh, uh, as urbanized as you see in Kauteng, Western Cape, and KZN, the epidemics there have a slightly different trajectory. They take long and they have small outbreaks. They have, because the transmission is slower, you see a lot of leftover, uh, spillover uh, outbreaks that continue to occur. Okay, so that's where things stand right now. So what are the lessons we've learned over the past 15 months or so? Well, let's start with the good. Well, one of the amazing things that we saw was the, the rapid way in which a diagnostic was developed for SARS-CoV-2. When you take that, you know, for a past epidemic that we've had of HIV, it took a few years before we had a diagnostic test. Whereas for SARS-CoV-2, it was within a month we had a diagnostic test because the sequence was available so early. And we have moved from laboratory-based PCR to now these rapid tests where you can get an answer now on a little card uh, within a matter of 15 minutes. So we've, we've seen new technology enabling us to do make the diagnosis much faster and more efficiently. We've seen new treatments become available in the recovery trial uh, in the UK. Uh, dexamethasone has been shown very clearly to have quite a marked impact on mortality. And of course, we have seen the way in which scientific innovations in vaccines have changed the face of this epidemic. When you think back to October, September, October last year, we weren't sure about how we were going to end this epidemic. But when it came to the 9th of November, when Pfizer announced its first results, we were just gobsmacked that we would have within a matter of what, not even nine months, an, a, a vaccine that's already shown to be effective and not just effective, but effective at 95%. So highly effective vaccines becoming available very early on changed our perspective about how we're going to deal with this pandemic. And we've seen in the way in which countries have responded, and I've chosen just to take our own country as an example, that uh, because we were able to uh, flatten the curve initially, we bought some time. And in that time, we started doing things. And among them, we started building field hospitals. We built field hospitals in the Cape Town Convention Center, field hospitals in Nazarek at uh, the showgrounds here in Peter Maritzburg. So we started building field hospitals because we knew that our existing hospital infrastructure may not cope with a surge. But we also know that oxygen is central. If you want to see what a lack of oxygen can do, just look at what's going on in India. India is now running out of oxygen. And as you may have heard yesterday, a hospital ran out of oxygen because of a leak in the tank and 22 people died. So oxygen is your savior in this pandemic. And so securing oxygen was central. And how did we do that? Uh, the four big companies that produce oxygen in South Africa were brought together. Special dispensation was obtained from the Competition Commission because they're not allowed to collude with each other. And we basically put to them that we need all the oxygen that they can supply. And uh, we learned that about half of all the oxygen manufactured in our country goes to commercial processes. These are industrial processes. And so the four big companies contacted their big customers and essentially told them that they won't be getting oxygen during the surge. Instead, all oxygen will be redirected 
to our hospitals. And so that's what happened in the first surge and in the second surge. We never ran out of oxygen. And the reason we didn't run out of oxygen because there was very detailed planning and ensuring that we had an adequate oxygen supply. So we've seen the way in which you know, very detailed planning can help deal with this problem in different ways. So I think one of the other things that we have seen in this pandemic, I've never seen this in any other disease. I mean, I've been involved in dealing with several pandemics and several local epidemics. I've never seen this level of communication. First is that the minister releases every day a press statement that provides all of the numbers that you need. Then you see regular, you know, regular televised updates by the president, by the minister. Uh, minister occasionally invites me to come and give, uh, you know, an update. We've seen the way in which the coronavirus website provides all kinds of detailed information. So I think I've seen a level of openness and communication that I've never seen with any other disease. So let's talk about the bad now. Well, 142 million infections, right? just over 3 million deaths. And most countries have already experienced their second waves. Second, several countries are now in the midst of their third waves, particularly in Europe, uh, in Brazil. India, by the way, is still in its second wave. So it's, it hasn't even got to third wave yet. But what we are seeing in many of these countries is the way in which, you know, wave after wave is taking its toll in terms of cases and deaths. And then we've seen, you know, other bad things. And we saw this in, in South Africa, just when, you know, things were looking good, cases were low as they are now. You know, people believe that, you know, they can take liberties. So they start dropping their guard. They become complacent. In November last year, we had an outbreak uh, at a club in Cape Town called Tin Roof. And that was the start of a small outbreak in Cape Town, but it was contained. But then we had a bigger outbreak, and that was at Fort Hay University. Over a thousand students went and had a weekend party in a tavern, drinking and socializing. And that led to the spread of the virus. And then we saw another outbreak a few days later at Nelson Mandela University. And that was it. That led to the wave starting in the Eastern Cape. In the midst of all of that, we had this variant and then not to be outdone, the metric students decide they're going to have a party in Belito. And we have over a thousand cases, confirmed cases, from that outbreak in Belito. So we cannot expect to control a pandemic and an epidemic like this if we are going to fundamentally flout the rules in terms of uh, you know, just making sure we don't create these super spreading events. And, you know, I'm, I'm concerned that Easter would have created some of those super spreading events, but it seems that those were contained and thankfully, so we're not in a situation that would have put us in a third wave as I was concerned about. And then we've seen new variants emerge. They called variants of interest or variants of concern. There are now three variants of concern that have been labeled as such uh, by Pangolin, uh, the uh, organization that manages the lineages. And these three variants are really causing havoc in the second and third waves. We've seen how the US, even though they've had you know, quite high levels of immunization, the B117 variant has been spreading rampantly in the US. And of course, in South Africa, we saw what the 501YV2 did to us in the second wave. And Brazil, after thinking it had brought the epidemic under control, the P1 variant is, of course, now leading to their wave. And so they <clears throat> actually just at the tail end 
of, of uh, their second wave. And so, in terms of the way in which we've had to deal with this pandemic, is we've had to deal with you know, just the way in the super spreading events, the rapidity with which it's growing, and now we have to worry about variants. And one of the things about these variants is the rapidity with which they spread. So if you look at the Western Cape, in the first wave, which is in the light green line, you can see how the first wave pan, you know, developed. However, if you look at the second wave, you can see how, oops, how it grew so much faster. In fact, in the, in the Western Cape, it was 50% faster to reach 100,000 cases in the second wave compared to the first wave. So what we are seeing in these variants is a virus that spreads much, much faster. But also, these variants are able to cause infection in individuals who have been previously infected. So what we're seeing with the variants is reinfection. And we saw that in our second wave. Several people who got infected in our second wave had already been infected in the first wave. And they thought, oh, I'm protected. I've been infected already in the first wave until they got infected again in the second wave. So I think we've been seeing this, this challenge emerging of that past infection doesn't protect you. And then finally, you know, really concerning is we saw how vaccine efficacy has been impacted by the 501YV2 variant. <clears throat> These are four vaccine trials that included South Africa. In AstraZeneca, we saw 70% protection from their vaccine in the UK and Brazil, but only 10% protection in South Africa. In Novavax, we saw 89% protection in the UK, but only 49% protection in South Africa. Whereas with the Johnson & Johnson and Pfizer, we saw a slightly different situation. In those vaccines, we saw 72% protection with Johnson Johnson US and 64% in South Africa. So only a, a small alteration in efficacy. And for Pfizer in the US, we, they have now reported their six month results as 91% in the US. And in the small study they did, in, you know, they included about 800 South Africans in their, in their study and they've shown 100% protection. In fact, total protection even against 501YB2. But admittedly, it's a small study. And also we've seen that one of the worst things I've seen is that we're seeing the effects of vaccine nationalism. And I'd like to quote the Director General of the World Health Organization when he says, the world is on, a, on the brink of a catastrophic moral failure. Even as they speak the language of equitable access, some countries and companies continue to prioritize bilateral deals, going around COVAX, driving up prices, attempting to jump to the front of the queue. This is wrong. And there are many ways in which vaccine nationalism plays itself out. The first, of course, is buying far more vaccines than you need. And if you look at the diagram on the right-hand side, Canada, has bought enough vaccines to vaccinate every one of its citizens five times. And so that's just over the top. Then we've seen how some countries like the US chose not to join COVAX, which is designed to provide equitable access to vaccines. And of course, since Biden became president, the US has now joined COVAX and is also funding COVAX. So thankfully that's been addressed. But we've seen how countries go around striking deals with pharmaceutical companies. If I was a pharmaceutical company, I would much rather have 50 countries, you know, all fighting for my few vaccines that I can make, as opposed to the 50 countries going to COVAX and COVAX coming to me and say, Oh, I'd like to buy your vaccines in the billions, and I want to pay you only a small price. So 
what has in effect happened is that we've gone around striking deals with pharmaceutical companies and we've been redirecting vaccine doses away from COVAX. I mean, the classic example of that is uh, when South Africa went uh, to the Serum Institute of India and struck a deal with them to buy vaccines by jumping the queue. So vaccines that were originally meant for COVAX actually landed up coming in South Africa. So we will see that, and countries are doing that all across the world because of the political pressure they are feeling from people who want them to be part of the vaccine nationalism problem. And so we've been seeing how countries are jumping the queue with higher prices uh, in order to secure vaccines. And I mean, from my point of view, it's really awful to see how you know, we are seeing the dangers of this kind of Trump-like me first vaccine nationalism. So instead of saying, you know, in a pandemic, we need to distribute vaccines equitably to all countries. Instead, countries are going around aiming to secure vaccines, saying, I want my vaccine first. I don't care about others. Right? Just make sure you get vaccines for us. We want ours. Don't care about others. And that's fundamentally a mistaken belief by some countries that they can vaccinate their populations and that they'll be safe. That somehow if they create an island or, you know, where everybody's vaccinated, that they feel that they can be safe in that way. Well, that's simply not true. It doesn't work like that. In this world that we live in, the coronavirus, no one is safe until everyone is safe. There is no end game where one country will succeed in controlling the virus while the rest of the world has rampant spread of the virus. And the reason for it is very simple. Every time the virus is spreading, you get the creation of new variants. And so even if you have vaccinated your population, you're now running the risk of a new variant that escapes immunity. So for me, the only one way to deal with this problem is we have to stand together. We have to have it's to do that because it's in everyone's interest. And we've seen that in the midst of the bad and the, you know, the good things that have happened, we've had to deal with the complicated things. And among those complicated things is to make the difficult decisions and right? to bravely face problems, not to waver in the midst of trying to deal with new challenges. And we've seen in our country how difficult decisions have been made, including those to temporarily suspend constitutional freedoms in order to prevent a widespread loss of life. And that we just have to accept that that being proactive is critical. And we've seen how denial, whether it's denial in HIV that we have had in our own country or denial of COVID-19 in the US and the President Trump, that how those have damaged those countries. And instead, we've chosen to go a route of saying, we will take this problem head on will make the difficult decisions, will take the consequences of those difficult decisions, but we won't hesitate to make them. And we can see how that if you don't make the decisions in a timely way, and that if you don't fully appreciate the lives versus livelihoods dichotomy and how you counterpose them in a way that's counterproductive, you create a problem. Now, Neil Ferguson, one of the advisors of the UK government, explained how the delay in the lockdown in the UK uh, led to a situation where they could have halved the total number of deaths in that period, I think it was around April, if they had just locked down earlier. So it's a difficult thing. You've got the problem of if you, if you lock down, you can prevent deaths. But if you lock down, you can create huge economic hardships that also have disastrous consequences. And we've seen that the Lancet Commission 
showed us that you know, the economic effects of this pandemic are unprecedented, that 90% of the countries were in recession in 2020, possibly exceeding the Great Depression of the 1930s. And even in Africa, we had the first recession in Africa in 25 years. So it's a difficult balance and you have to find that balance and you have to make those difficult decisions. I think one of the complicated things also is to provide scientific advice in the midst of very high levels of uncertainty, especially when you've got all these amazing people who know all the answers and they come from the University of WhatsApp and the University of Google and the University of Facebook and they've got opinions on everything and you have to deal with that. And giving scientific advice in the midst of minimal information and uncertainty, you have to take difficult decisions. And there's always this challenge, and we've seen it several scientists in our own country who you know, punt personal opinion and speculation masquerading as science. And you've got the dangers of these know-it-alls. You know, I know the answers. It's this useless, you know, government, often the government's black and the critics are white. And, you know, you have to deal with this kind of structural racism. You have to deal with the know-it-alls. And the individuals who say, you know, focus on me, show, you know, let, I want the limelight here. And we've had to deal with all of them. It's just part and parcel of the real world. And we have to be very careful that as we advise, we are not about posturing. You know, it doesn't matter what the decision is that's made. We give advice based on the best available evidence, based on the best that we can do, we provide. And the government can take it or not take it. That's the thing about advice. So we are not posturing, we're not advocating. We're just giving advice. And it doesn't matter what our personal preferences are. You just got to stay true to what the evidence is. And scientific advice is a very complicated process, but it's not half as complicated as the political decision because the political decision-making takes scientific advice as one of the factors that will feature in the decision making. And we've seen that in South Africa. For example, you know, uh, early on in September last year, you heard this kind of nonsense. You know, people in high density areas have generated this immunity because of previous widespread exposure to cold viruses. So we shouldn't worry about you know, the epidemic spreading in the townships because they've got cold viruses, so they don't have to worry about it. And the same professor believes that, you know, 40 to 45% of the population have already contracted the virus. And so we now have got herd immunity. We don't need to worry about a second wave. What are you talking about a second wave? And, you know, the same professor said, you know, it's only a plausible way to explain this decline in the first wave is that we've got herd immunity. So don't worry about a second wave, forget the second wave. Well, I think we've seen how it simply doesn't work like that. And we've, we've seen how the denialists, for example, the group calling themselves Panda, no, 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 there's nothing to worry about with COVID or SARS-CoV-2, it's just like flu. And we've seen that. In the US, of course, they've dealt with it in a much more complicated way. Uh, universities at Cornell, uh, researchers at Cornell University analyzed 38 million English language articles and found that 1.1 million had misinformation, mostly conspiracies. And the principal person quoting these conspiracies in the media was the president at the time. So, let me end off with the five lessons that I take away from the COVID response in South Africa. I think the first is that we took the disease seriously. You know, we didn't prevaricate. We didn't say, oh, we're not sure. You know, is this really serious? Is it just like flu? We didn't, we didn't wait to find out. We wanted to deal with this as a serious pandemic and we acted timelessly. We took the difficult decisions 
took the consequences of those difficult decisions, even if they were unpopular. We've been truthful. We've been proactive. I mean, I remember when I've been on television and I had to say to people, I have a difficult truth to tell you. And that is that there's nothing that's going to protect us. We're going to get a pandemic. We're going to get a massive first wave. It's coming. We, we can't sugarcoat this. We have to tell the public the truth. And we try to do that. We try to ensure that in the daily statistics, the public is aware how many cases were there yesterday, how many people died yesterday. You know that. You, you don't know. I, if I asked you how many people died from HIV yesterday, you have no idea. How many people died of HIV last year? You have no idea. Well, in COVID, you know exactly because it's told to you every day. Then the third is that this response that we've had in our country hasn't been without its errors and problems and abuses. We saw it in the military abuse in the Collins Causa case. We saw how some of the regulations were you know, irrational. Uh, we saw PPE corruption. And importantly, we've also seen how you know, even medical people have been punting miracle cures. You know, in the first wave, we want hydroxychloroquine. It's a miracle cure. In the second wave, we want ivermectin. We want this drug. It's a miracle cure. So, you know, I have, I've, I've had to deal with this, you know, in dealing with these miracle cure people. Uh, and South Africa, I have to say, is really impressive as a country. Uh, we can move mountains when we act together. I mean, I see, you know, in the first lockdown, how people, you know, who were struggling and others just started helping creating, you know, food uh, distribution, soup kitchens, just ordinary people, helping ordinary people. And you take, you know, our own country, we knew we were going to be short of ventilators. And so very early on, the department, uh, one of the government departments, decided to initiate a project to get ventilators manufactured in South Africa, so we wouldn't have to buy them. And what did we see? Well, DeFi, the company you know that makes your microwaves and your stoves and your fridges, they make ventilators. And they pivoted during the first wave uh, under the lockdown and they started making ventilators. And now in South Africa, we, you know, we use their ventilator. It's actually not a ventilator. It's, um, they, use, they make something called a, a ventilator machine for CPAP or for a high flow nasal cannula, which is a really important thing that we need. That's what saves lives. It's these little machines that ensure we supply enough oxygen to people in order to keep them alive. And I think importantly, we'll draw upon this experience, good and bad, to prepare for the next pandemic. We know that we've got to create some kind of epidemic response unit. We've got to develop and build local diagnostic and vaccine manufacturing facilities. We've got to ensure we have the capability to undertake surveillance for variants. So all of these things are lessons we've learned from this first, uh, from this pandemic that we'll take into the future. Let me end off with, you know, truly inspiring leadership, and that comes from Pope Francis in an editorial that he published in the New York Times that entitled The Crisis Reveals What's in Our Hearts. I'd like to quote from Pope Francis, the head of the Catholic Church. He said, the pandemic has exposed the paradox that while we are more connected, we are also more divided. To come out of this crisis better, we have to recover the knowledge that as a people, we have a shared destination. The pandemic has reminded us that no one is saved alone. What ties us to one another is what we commonly call solidarity. Solidarity is more than acts of generosity, as important as they are. It is the call to embrace the reality that we are bound by the bonds of reciprocity 
In other words, what Pope Francis is saying, that I am safe because you are safe. You are safe because I am safe. That reciprocity, that understanding that we are interdependent is fundamental. So for those who want to break that interdependence, who want to ignore that interdependence, who want to act on their own, who want to proceed to not wearing a mask because they don't want to wear a mask, they are failing to understand that their actions are not only impacting them, they're impacting all of us. One person putting themselves at risk puts all of us at risk. All of us who work with them, who share the taxi with them, who walk with them in the street, all of those things, that individual puts all of us at risk. And so I will leave you on that note of appreciating our interdependence and recognizing that we are truly bound by the bonds of reciprocity. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. That was a that very, was very beautiful, beautiful presentation. Um, uh, before we move on, I, I would love to ask some personal questions before I pick on questions that have been presented in the Q and A. We have, and we also have a question sent through email, and these are very important questions that we think only you can answer for now. So um, first, I am very, very interested in the way you explain the issue around Basin nationalism, especially within the context of how Africa fits into that, that kind of quest, global quest from the key actors in scrambling for vaccines even before it gets here to Africa. So, and I realized in your presentation that you, you spoke about that, but I want to know how you were able to get that during, uh, when you were in that office. Was there any Pan-African initiative that was instituted where um, your colleagues elsewhere in Africa was able to also go through COVAX or take through, maybe there is an initiative at the African CDC where you try to procure vaccines or you try to enable local production of vaccines on the continent. Mm -hmm. And also, I am also interested about your position as regards to the Madagascar organic. You know, sometimes last year, the Madagascar government came up with that substance and said it was a cure to, to COVID. Do you think it is a conspiracy or you think it's scientific? And what was the approach of your committee towards it? Did you collect the substance at any time for further testing and um, authentication? I really want you to provide some insight to them. Then also you provided a very, very interesting approach and strategy you, you, you adopted with regards to ventilation, especially with regards to oxygen. I want to know if that was the same approach you adopted with regards to vaccines. You said you, you brought top, big, top companies together to, pro, to produce um, ventilators and to provide oxygen. Did you also do the same with regards to vaccines? Did we have your committee liaising with um, local companies to produce um, vaccines? And was that the product? Uh, the consequence of the recent um, um, re recent development with Aspen's production of vaccines. So I really want you to provide answers to that before we go to other questions. Right. In the remaining six minutes, let me try and answer some of the questions that you've asked. Um, so let's start with vaccine distribution and the challenges that we've had. Fundamentally, we had hoped that COVAX would be the main supplier of vaccines to much of Africa. We have a long history of Africa depending on Gavi 
for childhood vaccinations. And so we anticipated that that would also apply to uh, coronavirus vaccines. But instead, what we had was severe challenges experienced by COVAX. Funding challenges, but basically the main challenge was getting enough vaccines. And in trying to do that, the African Union understood that they couldn't depend on COVAX on its own. And so the African Union established its own vaccine acquisition platform. That vaccine acquisition platform is uh, about a billion vaccines that they have signed up. And those vaccines are still to be obtained and then they'll be distributed throughout Africa. But right now, COVAX is the main source of vaccines in much of Africa. In South Africa, we, several years ago, I'm talking now about three decades ago, South Africa used to make all its own vaccines. We never bought vaccines from any other country. But over the years, our capacity to manufacture vaccines has been eroded, partly because the science is more complicated, regulatory framework is more difficult, and also India can make it much cheaper than we can. So it is costing us a lot more to make our own vaccines here than we could just buy it from India. And so we eroded that capacity and consolidated it into one facility called BioVac in Cape Town. So BioVac can make vaccines. The problem is it can't make the two vaccines because of the, the two the platforms of vaccines because that's new technology. So if you look at the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines, they are mRNA vaccines, technology we don't have. We've never made those kinds of vaccines. No one has made those vaccines. The first ever mRNA vaccines are those two vaccines. So no way in the world is that capacity was already existing to make mRNA vaccines. The second was that the second platform of vaccines, the J&J, &J, uh, AstraZeneca, and the Sputnik vaccines, they are all live viral vector vaccines. And those live viral vector vaccines, they're very difficult to make because they are live viruses. They are adenoviruses that are live. We have no capacity in this country to make them. So in essence, we cannot make mRNA vaccines and we cannot make live viral vector vaccines. In fact, there is nowhere in Africa that can make those vaccines. And just for clarification, Aspen is not making any vaccines. Aspen is just a, a business that's there to make money. They don't actually do research. They don't make you know, innovative things. They copy what others have done. And in this particular instance of Johnson & Johnson, the vaccine is actually made elsewhere. That what Aspen is doing is putting it into bottles and labeling it and distributing it. It's what is called fill and finish contribution. So there is no capacity to make these vaccines in Africa as we speak. But thankfully, last week, we had a big meeting hosted by Presidents Ramaphosa and Kagame to actually look at this question. And at this big meeting, which was attended by about 2,000 people, including several CEOs, uh, the, the head of uh, Johnson & Johnson was there, the head of GSK was there, there is now a firm pledge to assist Africa in establishing vaccine manufacturing capacity. And I myself have taken up part of that role to support the African CDC in establishing that capacity. And initially, we'll probably aim for about three to five facilities to be able to manufacture vaccines. And the platform technologies that we want to try and build is mRNA, because mRNA is the platform for the future. Let me just briefly deal with the Madagascan uh, concoction, which was based on artemisinin, it's nonsense. I mean, if people want to believe that, you know, you can use artemisinin, which is a drug you use to treat malaria, which has no effect on viruses, 
if that's you know how you're going to treat people, it's literally you know there's no evidence for it. So the laboratory in Germany was working with the Madagascans, and they showed that the artemisinin at high enough concentrations can inhibit the virus. Now it's interesting that in the midst of the pandemic, that when you get into a surge, that drugs that are originally made for parasites are suddenly being proposed as drugs to be used for viruses. So hydroxychloroquine is also a drug used for malaria, right? And now is being proposed for use in COVID. The same with artemisinin in the Madagascan, and the same with ivermectin. Ivermectin treats roundworms. Right? It's, it's a very good drug for uh, river blindness. In fact, it's, 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 it's an amazing drug for river blindness. Right? It's almost eliminated river blindness from South Africa, a disease called onchocerciasis. So, but they don't work against viruses. So there's this, but you'll be amazed at the number of people who will go on television and say, why haven't we got our ivermectin? Why haven't we got our hydroxychloroquine or our artemisin from Madagascar? It's just nonsense. Um, I'll just touch on the issue of, um, you know, where are we going to in terms of, uh, you know, how are we trying to move forward? I think we have seen that while we can, you know, bring people together, bring companies together, we can get, you know, the Competition Commission to give us waivers to bring people together to solve problems like oxygen and ventilators. Vaccines are very different because vaccines, we don't make any. Right? The vaccines are all made by big pharmaceutical companies. And they were largely made with funding from Operation Warp Speed. Operation Warp Speed contributed about $18 billion. And so money was thrown at the big companies to make vaccines. The vaccine made by Moderna is actually a vaccine made by the US government researchers. Moderna you know, is a small company, they don't really not really in existence until it came to this vaccine. And they have now grown and they are now you know, making these vaccines. All of the clinical studies to show that the Moderna vaccine works were all funded by the US government. In fact, the Pfizer vaccines, those are all funded, uh, not uh, Pfizer, sorry, uh, the Johnson & Johnson vaccines funded by the US government. So the US government principally funded much of this research as part of Operation Warp Speed. Now, interestingly, Pfizer never took money from Operation Warp Speed. They used their own dollars to make the Pfizer vaccine. So Pfizer is one of the few vaccines that you can get you know, everywhere around in the world because they are not committed to the US government. So the US government is very simple, will pay and we'll give you all the money you want to manufacture and test your vaccine. If it works, you have to commit to giving us the first doses as we want it. So all those who are part of Operation Warp Speed are committed to giving their doses to the US government. And if they want to give it anywhere else, they have to ask permission. So that's part and parcel of the leverage that the US government did. No one else did that. Well, the UK government did that. They did that with AstraZeneca. The UK government funded the AstraZeneca studies almost entirely. 97% uh, or so of the funding for AstraZeneca came from the UK government. And of course, when AstraZeneca wanted to do their studies in the US, they went to Operation Warp Speed. So this is governments providing bulk of the funding and the governments that do then get priority. So everyone else joined the queue. You gotta wait. You wait until you know those who put the money up get their vaccines first. Thank you so uh, much. Okay. Now we now have, we have now about we have five have minutes, minutes Prof, um, for a short break, and after we have um, Professor Akia Bayomi um, from Lagos. He's the 
Honorable Commissioner of Health also discussing from his own side some of the major challenges he faced that um, in the control of, of COVID-19. And I'm, I'm actually very interested, Prof. We have some very interesting questions here in the Q&A. Like there is one question there that is asking about whether COVID, whether you think COVID is a bow weapon. And I, I know you will be very interested in answering this kind of questions. Um, but we will be having you and Professor Abayomi on the same panel to provide answers to some of these questions subsequently. So in the next 50 minutes, we will have the q and here. So thank you so much, Prof. So I we will come back in the next five. Yeah. Hello. You hear that? Yes, that echo is coming from your side, from your system. This or this? This. Right. Let's let's let me leave. Let me leave Zoom completely. Um, oh, I think the reason maybe is that I'm connected on two. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, so he's picking this and picking that. Okay. Can you talk? Hello. Perfect. We're good. So it's me. Yes, Prof. Prof. I'm double connected. Hello. 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 So we so can't use the speaker with us.
the thing is this. Let me talk. Hello. Yes. So we are about to commence the the second um, lecture. Um, we are very very privileged to also have a very reputable scientist, scholar, and uh, policymaker, and who was actually a major player um, during the early early period of the COVID-19 pandemic, and he's still a big player as we speak. Uh, we have um, Professor Akin Abayomi, who is the Honorable Commissioner of Health Legal State. As we all know, Legal State is the epicenter, was the epicenter of the pandemic in Nigeria. Um, Professor Akin Abayomi led the team that sought to mitigate the virus and the, the virus and he played a key role alongside the governor of Lagos State to controlling the virus. So it is really a privilege for us here at the Rose University African Studies Center and the Institute of African Diaspora Studies there in Lagos to host this scholar, a scholar of this caliber. Um, before we commence, I would just, I would love to read Professor Abayomi's um, citation so that we all know him. Uh, Professor Abayomi is a specialist in internal medicine, hematology, uh, biosecurity, environmental health, and human development. He received his first degree in medicine at the Royal Medical College, at the Royal Medical College of St. Bartholomew's Hospital in University of London, with fellowship from both Royal College of Medicine and Pathology in the United Kingdom and the College of Medicine in South Africa. His focus has been mainly on the concept of emerging infectious diseases and the development of laboratory and clinical capacity in Africa. Professor Ed Biomi was the chief pathologist and the head of division of hematology at the University of Stellenbosch Faculty of Medicine Science in 2009 in Cape Town, South Africa. He was also a consultant at the University of West Indies and the University of Zimbabwe. He has been exposed to a vast variety of geographical variations and disease patterns within the field of internal medicine, having worked in diverse countries of the world. Professor Akinabayomi was the chair of the H3 African Consortium Data and Biospecimen Access Committee, as well as the founder of the Global Emerging Pathogen Consortium which was entrenched at the peak of the Ebola outbreak to address biosecurity concerns in Africa. He was a consultant to the Lagos State Biosecurity and Genomics Project in 2014. He was a member of the board and honorable professor to the Center of Biosecurity Studies, University of the West Indies, Cape Eve Campus, Barbados, Caribbean, 2018 as well as a professor of medicine at the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research in Lagos, Nigeria, 2018. Professor Akembaomi was a member of the African Academy of Science Committee on Data Governance and also the lead consultant on the Biobank Biosecurity Biodata Rescue Project in Syria alone and Lagos, Nigeria. He is consulting for the Lagos State Biosecurity Project and the West African Health Organization Biosecurity and Biobanking Framework to service the ECOWAS members. Um, Professor Akin Abayomi is now the Honorable Commissioner of Health in Lagos State, Nigeria, under the administration of Governor Babajide Sanwolu. Uh, Professor Abayomi, it's a pleasure to have you here. We look forward to uh, robo a robust engagement with you, just like the way we had um, in the previous lecture and yesterday. Um, Professor Bayomi, if you're around, please, you have the floor.
Hello, everyone. Just um, we we will get back to you in a few minutes. Um, we are waiting on Professor Akinbayomi to come online to present his lecture. Thank you.
Good morning, Prof. Um, Good morning. How are you? I'm all right, Prof. Thank you so much for coming. Um, yeah. We have done your. We have done the citation already, and um, we will commence the presentation now. So um, before now, we had um, Professor Abdukarim's section, and um, yourself and him will be attending to the questions and answer after your presentation. There are very interesting questions here already. Um, so here at the um, Rose University African Studies Center and um, the Institute of African and Diaspora Studies Legacy, we want to welcome you. And we are very honored for uh, acknowledging this um, invitation. Um, we are looking forward to your presentation, specifically your reflections on your activities there in Lagos, the epicenter of the COVID-19 pandemic. So we really want to know um, the politics, the economy, and um, the medicine of the pandemic. We, you have the floor now, Prof. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, let me try and share my slides. Can you see my slides? Yes, Prof. Yes, Prof. Yes, Prof. Yes, Prof. Okay, good. All right, thank you very much. And uh, thank you and hello to my senior colleagues in South Africa, especially Professor Karim. Nice to meet you online again. Um, I'm going to just go over some of the experiences that we've had in Lagos uh, preceding COVID in COVID and what we're going to do moving forward uh, from COVID. So essentially, um, uh, let me just do a sound check. Uh, I, I hope my voice is being projected well. Yes, Prof. Yes, Prof. Yes, Prof. Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Um, so basically we... Um, hinged our approach in Lagos. So Lagos, Nigeria, um, it used to be the political capital, but it's that moved to Abuja uh, and left Lagos as the commercial capital. It's one of, well, it is the mega city of Africa. It's 25 million population. It's situated on the coast. It's a very dense population, um, one of the densest human footprints per square kilometer in Africa, um, and as such, it is very vulnerable to biosecurity threats, um, to contagions and to pathogens of high consequence, because <clears throat> anything that is um, spreading by airborne or waterborne, uh, the inhabitants of several parts of Lagos will be very vulnerable uh, to such kinds of scenarios. So anyway, uh, so our five critical principles were anticipation, mitigation, and adaptation, learning, and systemic resilience. And so let me go through these uh, five principles um, systematically. What did we do as Lagos State? If you recall that in 2015, 2014, 2015, we experienced uh, an Ebola outbreak which was an extension of the West African outbreak that came from Sierra Leone, Liberia, and Guinea. And that was a very worrying uh, time for us because uh, of the um, characteristics of Lagos. It would, if we had not quickly um, contained it, it could have become a major um, um, disaster in the West African axis. And of course, it would have affected many other countries. So after our Ebola experience, we developed what we call a biosecurity roadmap, um, which um, comprised of building uh, a BSL-2, BSL-3 laboratory, which is where you manage um, category A pathogens. Uh, we don't have a BSL-4 like you have in South Africa, which is based at the NICD in Johannesburg. But we're planning towards that. But um, you can handle a lot of dangerous pathogens in a BSL-3. 
so we recognized that weakness during the Ebola that we didn't have a high level biosecurity lab. And so we set out to develop one and we worked in collaboration with the Canadian government and, the, uh, and a company in South Africa to develop a containment facility. And we also started to make provisions for uh, a surge situation, that is uh, isolation wards that would contain large numbers of people. Um, I'll show you slides uh, around that. So that up there with the uh, roof is the biosafety lab two, three and biobank. And that was actually commissioned a couple of months before the COVID outbreak. So we were indeed ready. And as you can see from this picture, we had started to um, refurbish and expand our isolation capacity in Lagos in preparation. But then going back, you know, we then, you know, we had always known that we were going to expect something after Ebola. The WHO had kept talking about pathogen X. You know, we were, we were more focused on things like um, um, pandemic flu, uh, but we didn't know what it was going to be, but we were certainly sure something was going to happen. And then when we started hearing the rumors or, well, the events in China, um, and it started spreading out of China. Then we started to ramp up our preparation in Lagos because Lagos has a very close working relationship with China in terms of trade and industry. And we have a lot of Nigerians and Chinese citizens moving back and forth between China um, and certainly um, between um, Lagos and the Middle East and Lagos and Europe. So when it started to spread to the Middle East and to Europe, we knew for sure that we were gonna get some cases in Nigeria. And so we started to prepare um, assiduously. So what we did in Lagos was we set up what we call an incident command system. It's a almost a uh, military style um, setup. It's set up during um, um, anticipated major um, shocks to a system. And it has a very strong hierarchy leading all the way up to the highest authority in the state, which is the governor. So the governor there reflected as Mr. G M G became the incident commander. I became the deputy incident commander and we set up a several pillars that um, kicked into action even before we had our index case so that we started to prepare systematically um, through logistics research, the incident command emergency operations center in green, the, strat the strategic pillar, the supply chain and logistics and uh, operations. And at the top, you can see that we had the opportunity for every member of cabinet to participate depending on, on their uh, line ministry. We also had the opportunity for developmental uh, partners to engage like the WHO, UNICEF, uh, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. And the think tank there was supposed to create the opportunity for the government and the private sector to collaborate. So the think tank was comprised of um, a variety of specialists from the private sector that would support the government in the event that we had cases um, popping up in Lagos. Uh, just to point out that the civil service, I think in most countries is not geared towards um, dealing with major uh, calamities. And so it's important that the government recognizes this and the government pulls on all its resources to address, prepare and address a shock to the system. So we built um, three scenarios. The first scenario, of course, never happened, which was that we would um, not see any cases at all. The second scenario we believed was would be the most likely scenario where we would see um, cases, but we would bring them under control. And the third scenario was where we would have an extensive outbreak that the system was unable to contain. And that would, of course, be a calamity. And we, you know, watching CNN and BBC, 
you can see that many countries are actually going through scenario three. But I think adequate preparation um, was the key for Lagos. We were able to nip things very much in the bud and maintain a very tight control through this uh, incident command structure that I just described. And so it was a hairy time, but I think we were able to maintain the Lagos situation uh, in scenario two. So how did we mitigate? Uh, mitigation is strategies that are immediately deployed to reduce the impact of a shock to a system. And the whole idea in um, pathogens of high consequence is to um, affect what everyone talks about, uh, which is flattening the curve. But um, just to point out that the whole point of flattening the curve is, is really to keep uh, the number of cases that you're seeing at any point in time underneath the broken line there, which is the uh, limit of your system to cope. So it's not that you will see uh, fewer numbers of cases, but you don't want to see all those cases at the same time. Um, so it's important that uh, when we got into the community transmission phase of COVID after our index cases started arriving, that we were able to put strategies in place that reduced the ability of the virus to spread from person to person. Uh, there was containment strategies, there was public awareness strategies, there was lockdown. And so at all points in time throughout our outbreaks to date, we've been able to uh, keep the number of cases underneath our systemic ability to manage cases. Um, but remembering that we were improving our capacity all the time, so that dotted line there actually should be a gradient showing Lagos' ability to uh, manage more and more cases at any point in time. So with our first wave, we had several strategies, containment, um, isolation, uh, in centers, the introduction of um, the private sector, because we needed to test more and more people. And the government had the limited capacity to test, so we opened it up to the private sector, but we regulated it. So during um, biological shocks, it's a the responsibility belongs to the government um, because of the biosecurity nature of the situation. And the government's responsibility is to regulate very closely uh, who and who can participate and who has the skill sets and the infrastructure to collaborate with government. So we opened up the management to both um, the care of patients and to the diagnosis of patients to the private sector, but we regulated it very tightly and we had a consortium of laboratories and a consortium of caregivers in the private sector that we were monitoring and maintaining their quality and ensuring that they were doing the right thing and that their staff were safe and nobody was being at, being put at excessive risk. Um, when our numbers started to increase dramatically, uh, we looked obviously at the, um, the uh, natural history of, of COVID in, in Lagos and we realized it was slightly different to what we were seeing in the Northern Hemisphere. And so we quickly changed our strategy um, to what we call the inclusion of home-based care using um, digital technology and telemedicine um, so that we could decongest our isolation facilities, manage the mild to moderates at home and reserve our isolation facilities for severe to critical cases. So these arrows just show the multiple change in policies across our profile. Um, and then we moved into the adaptation phase, which is a strategy to um, the process of change um, to be in a better position to manage the crisis that you're dealing with. We did this with a lot of uh, mathematical modeling. Um, I'm just showing you some very basic um, modeling outcomes that we did in Lagos, but we went through an elaborate process, used mathematicians and modelers. And this is our first wave. And we had predicted as early as May that if we carried on with our strategy, we would be able to contain the outbreak 
in July, August of 2020, and after that, it would start to subside. And indeed, this is what we saw. So if you see the um, red line, it's the profile of our outbreak. The first wave uh, peaked in June, July, slight peak there in August, and then it subsided. And we went into <clears throat> relax mode. Um, we allowed the economy to open up a bit. Um, but of course, uh, we were always anticipating that there was going to be a second wave. And we knew that that was going to happen uh, most likely around the festive season of December and January, when a lot of people returned to Lagos for the vacation. And obviously, they would be bringing in um, more infections and as we know now uh, bringing in mutations that um, we not necessarily had developed herd immunity to from natural infection in our environment so of course the second wave was larger uh, it was more aggressive but surprisingly and to the credit of the medical team the huge medical team that we put together in Lagos, comprising of about 3,000 health professionals. Um, we were able to reduce the deaths in the second wave. So the first wave we had more, even though it was a smaller wave, we had more deaths. And in the second wave, we had fewer deaths, even though we had more cases and more aggressive cases. And that was because we were following the science and we were constantly building our capacity, understanding and learning how to manage COVID and understanding the pathophysiology of COVID. And so even though we had a lot more aggressive disease in younger patients, we had fewer deaths. So that's what this slide really reflects, the learning process. You know, we used a lot of distance learning using technology and international interactions. We engaged in our own indigenous research to understand the profile of the disease in Lagos. We did a lot of literature review and search. And of course, we did direct observation of, of the profile of the disease in our environment. A lot of our management was data-based. We were looking, we're collecting data per second, per second. So at every point in the outbreak, every day, every hour, we knew where the cases were. We knew how the outbreak was uh, progressing and we're using this data to change policy uh, on a very in a very dynamic and fluid way so how did we start to build resilience into the system you know, after the first wave we um, focused as i said on public private partnerships and we pulled in not just the technical expertise in the private sector in lagos but we went abroad as well. We uh, engaged with our colleagues across Africa, in South Africa, and in Europe and America. And we were able to quickly uh, adapt to um, the change in understanding of the disease. A lot of it was based on technology. As I said, we shifted most of our care to um, home base using uh, telemedicine consultations and those that were not doing well at home were transferred to um, isolation facilities. We soon learned that early administration of oxygen and addressing the coagulopathies associated with um, COVID was key. And we didn't require to ventilate that many people because our uh, interventions were very early on um, and addressing those kinds of situations. And of course, you know, communicating with the public was very important. Uh, we had daily briefings. Uh, we kept the population very informed about what was happening. You know, and we were very transparent uh, with our community. This is just an idea of how we managed the home-based care using telemedicine. Um, uh, we managed a lot of patients uh, remotely, and there, you know, those are uh, examples of myself, uh, Mr. Governor, the Deputy Governor the Commissioner of Information and Strategy, constantly interacting with the public and defining and refining our strategies and explaining why we were doing what we were doing. And as you can see, you know, um, those are very worried looks on our faces because we, at that point in time, really didn't know where this first wave was going. The picture that was being painted across the world 
places like Brazil, uh, America, and Europe was a very scary uh, phenomenon for us because we don't have uh, health systems that are that strong and robust to cope with the kind of, of, of surge of very critical patients that were happening in other parts of the world. And inclusive of South Africa, we were watching South Africa very closely and we were watching um, cities like Johannesburg and Cape Town and Bombay in India, which had similar demographics to, to Lagos. And we were just watching how the disease was trending in these environments and trying to um, learn lessons from, from these situations. So we went into our inevitable second wave, as I described. Um, there, we, our strategy there was to expand our testing. The more you test, the more you can contain. Um, we uh, reopened a lot of isolation facilities that had been decommissioned after the first wave. Um, we uh, included more private sector. We built uh, oxygen plants. We developed what we call oxygen kiosks um, because people would typically sometimes present very late um, and then trying to get through the traffic in a mega city like Lagos when you're breathless is not a nice experience. So we decentralized our access to oxygen um, uh, so that people could be stabilized near their homes. And when they were stable, they could then be transferred to isolation centers for more intensive uh, management and supervision. And of course, we expanded our home-based care. So our oxygen strategy, again, you know, government is not designed to build or to respond to um, um, massive uh, shocks to the system. Uh, the government is a civil service. It's, it's very bureaucratic. And so we developed very fast track um, uh, processes. We outsourced a lot. So for example, our experience logistics is very important in shock in shock situations and um, it's important that you you move very quickly and oxygen became a very um, a precious commodity and we outsourced the logistics of, of, of obtaining oxygen and making oxygen um, part of it to the private sector as I said we built oxygen plants and oxygen centers and these are examples of um, decentralized access to oxygen. So these are just what we call oxygen kiosks. If you are short of breath, you can see the open plan there, um, paying attention to infection prevention control. The patients would come, they would be triaged on that open section there. If they were positive, they would then move and they were breathless, they would receive oxygen straight away as we determine what their status is. And then once they're stable, they can be uh, referred to uh, one of the isolation centers. So we built several of these across Lagos so that citizens of Lagos could get to oxygen very quickly, which was a life-saving strategy for many cases. We also built um, um, oxygen plants in several of our general hospitals. We built um, two, uh, one producing 60 cylinders per day and these are the very large cylinders, and we built a second one um, making 100 cylinders. So we were able to get oxygen to our patients in the isolation centers very quickly while we maintained our external supply of oxygen so that um, we were able to cope with the sudden surge in demand for oxygen. So what we also learned very quickly is that we couldn't focus all our attention on the on the public health crisis. We need to, we needed to avert an economic crisis. And there was the balance between uh, the public health response and the livelihoods of our citizens. Lockdown was very disastrous for us. Um, lots of businesses went out of um, commission. There was a lot of um, <clears throat> loss of income, and so we had to. Uh, relaxed that very quickly because we were on the brink of, of, of a breakdown of uh, law and order and, and chaos. And so we, many of our strategies were able to find that middle of the road where we were still able to, to manage the public health crisis, but allow people to generate their day-to-day -day income. Uh, many people in Lagos um, 
live from day to day, <clears throat> which means that what they earn for that day is their means of survival um, with very little safety nets um, and very little um, income reserves. And so it was important that um, we did not, you know, go overboard with, with, um, you know, uh, guidelines that um, cripple the economy, and you know, more people would die, would have died from from the consequences of economic lockdown and insecurity and breakdown of law and order than from COVID itself. So we were able to find that happy balance. So now we've overcome our second wave. Um, we've flattened the curve completely. We're now again in a second valley. We are watching the landscape very carefully. We're seeing what's happening in India. We're watching what's happening in Kenya. We're watching what's happening in South Africa. We're looking at Brazil. We're seeing what happened, what has transpired in Europe. And so this is the strategy for mitigating our third wave um, we, we're going to keep testing. Um, we're very worried about inbound travelers uh, who may be carrying mutants and variants. So um, any inbound traveler that's positive, we plan to perform um, mutant PCR and sequencing on them. We're trying to establish that right now so that we can have some genomic intelligence on, on, on when you know, we're seeing um, a, a strain that we've not come across here in Lagos before, which might um, be the um, uh, forewarning of a, of, uh, a um, third wave, uh, because obviously the immunity that would have been generated from the first and the second wave may not be as effective against a third wave uh, um, being caused by a new mutant that is um, foreign to this environment. We're building up our digital platform to make sure that we can use our telemedicine to monitor people and particularly travelers who are inbound to ensure that they are isolating and that they are coming for their release tests and that if they're positive that we can um, track them and <clears throat> make sure that they come uh, for second tests where we can try and understand which kind of mutants uh, they are carrying. Mm -hmm. Of course, the non-pharmaceutical interventions still maintain uh, trying to discourage um, super spreader events. And then finally, the whole issue around vaccination. Um, we know that we have a significant amount of um, herd immunity from natural infection in Lagos, but we also realize that the vaccine is important to raise that level of immunity irrespective of whether you've had the natural infection or not. And of course, the magic figure there is 60% of your population should acquire some level of herd immunity, uh, either by natural infection or by vaccination, in order for you to have a chance of withstanding an aggressive variant that may come into the environment to trigger a third wave. And these are basically the principles of our strategy our vaccine strategy, which is obviously at the end of the day to reduce deaths, to improve our system's resilience and keep that flattened curve strategy where people may catch COVID, but um, the severe to critical cases, it would avert severe to critical cases, thereby allowing us to manage more people at home rather than in our isolation centers where we would be quickly overwhelmed if um, many people were presenting with uh, severe uh, systemic failure, um, respiratory or systems failure. Of course, we know that these are new vaccines um, that haven't had a long history of uh, pharmacovigilance. Uh, you know, even though they've been approved, they haven't gone through a, tri a long-term trial. As you can see, we're picking up problems with AstraZeneca, uh, which is the vaccine we're using at the moment. Uh, there are some side effects. Um, the global literature is showing us that there are some coagulopathies that develop even with the vaccine. We picked up a few cases as well. So it's important that we understand how the vaccine works, what type of side effects we can anticipate and how to manage them 
and with the coagulopathies we've seen, um, they resemble um, a particular type of coagulopathy, which we refer to as heparin-induced thrombocytopenia for those who are in the medical fraternity. It's a kind of coagulopathy triggered by the use of uh, an anticoagulant called heparin. And the pathophysiology of the coagulopathies we've seen in Lagos are uh, typical of the uh, heparin-induced type phenomenon. And so that has guided us as to how to manage um, these kinds of uh, severe or adverse event, events of significant or, or, or special interest. And as I said, at the end of the day, you know, it's important that we manage the economy in parallel with managing the public health crisis. So this is just a dashboard of our first pilot uh, vaccination rollout in Lagos. We've vaccinated 259,000 people with AstraZeneca first dose. And you can see in blue there the graph that shows uh, over the past 20 days how we've been able to increase the number of people um, being vaccinated. We have a combination of um, um, high uptake as well as uh, hesitancy. The hesitancy we've observed is very high amongst medical personnel, uh, but high uptake amongst the general population. So there is a huge demand for the vaccine in Lagos. Um, and the, and this is just the profile. We're reaching the tail end of our of our first pilot phase, and um, we're going to start administering the second dose to those who have who have received the first dose. And this is just a map of Nigeria showing um, how Lagos has been able to vaccinate over 200,000 individuals single dose um, compared to other states in, in Nigeria. So we're building a resilient system. We are not stopping. We are anticipating a third wave. We're putting systems in place. Um, we're keeping uh, infrastructure upgraded. We are keeping a, a, a kind of machinery that we can rapidly roll out at any point in time should we start to pick up signals of a um, third wave. Of course, you know, the whole issue of supply and demand is very germane to our system. This is the ecosystem of our healthcare structure, primary healthcare, general hospitals, and our tertiary facility. And that's the backbone of our healthcare facilities. We recognize that we have weak health systems. And generally speaking, our strategic goal, irrespective of COVID, is to be able to build stronger health systems uh, based on those parameters. And uh, these are the strategic directions in which we're going, uh, increasing governance, modernizing healthcare, improving our digital platforms, of course, increasing our healthcare professional training programs, re um, slowing down brain drain, strengthening the uh, state health insurance scheme, establishing a medical innovation and industrial park and development of more specialist facilities, including infectious disease research centers and building a more robust biosecurity roadmap in Lagos. Um, so these are some of the, uh, what we call the new infrastructure blueprints. This is going to be our new design for primary health care facilities. We've built this uh, with a particular attention to low carbon footprint, attention to infection prevention control, and the ability to repurpose this kind of primary health care facility to a biological shock environment. So um, our new primary health care facilities will look like this. Uh, we're going to start building these towards the end of this year. And hopefully if we can build um, um, a sizable number of these kinds of uh, new blueprints, uh, we would be able in a better position to withstand future shocks to our system. We have the blueprint ex extending to our general hospitals. So we have now developed a blueprint for general hospitals. And we've adapted the first of these to a pediatric hospital, which is currently being built along the uh, Osborne Road uh, Adeniji Adele axis of Lagos Island. Um, that will be the first of our general hospitals that is coming out of our blueprint design that is the Mr. Governor's mandate. 
Of course, uh, digital technology is important. I said that we use data to drive our response to COVID. We collected a lot of real-time data and we're building what we call the smart health information platform, which in future will help us to respond faster, quicker, um, more resourcefully to these kinds of scenarios. Um, so I think um, I will just say we um, have a number of private public partnerships that are helping us build a more robust and resilient system. Um, we've learned that the private sector is very important. As you can see here, we've shifted most of our testing to the private sector, um, which has been done two things. It has increased our ability to test and it has made it less of a burden on the government because uh, the private sector is quite keen to participate in these kinds of scenarios. So in conclusion, um, we've learned a number of lessons from the COVID outbreak. Um, we've learned retrospectively from similar outbreaks in the past, like I said, Ebola. Uh, we've learned from the first wave. We use that to manage the second wave. Uh, it's helped us to make very swift uh, decisions and policies. And we've engaged a lot of intellectuals in our environment and beyond our environment many Nigerians across the world in the diaspora have been involved. My colleagues that I know well in South Africa have engaged with them in trying to refine and define the strategy for Lagos. Uh, on that note, I will yield the floor and thank you very much for the opportunity. I'm glad to take questions. Thank you so Thank much, you. <laughs> So. Thank you so much, Prof. We appreciate you for that very, very um, important and interesting presentation. And Prof, I must tell you that a lot of people have sent questions and, and we are hoping you will have some time to provide answers to them. And if it's possible, Prof, can you please help us to switch on your video so um, our participants can see you and we'll be able to relate with you better, if that is possible, Prof. Yes, just hold on a moment. Yes. You can go ahead with the questions. Okay, Prof. So first, um, I'm going to ask my personal questions before I go to the Q&A session. First, um, we have a pending question as regards um, vaccine nationalism, um, the quest by some very strong um, global powers to, to scramble for vaccines at the expense of very vulnerable countries like um, countries in sub-Saharan Africa. So we want to understand how you are able to mitigate the problem around vaccine nationalism. Do you still go through the platform of COVAX to procure vaccines or you have alternative platforms? Is there a pan-African initiative that is ongoing? Is there a connection, a relationship between the Lagos state government and the African CDC in respect to vaccine procurement? And what also is your position about um, um, local local vaccine production. Is there is there a way the Lagos State government um, in sync with the federal government? Is there a way you are trying to encourage the local production of vaccines? Uh, African population is about 1.2 billion. So how do you how do we have a situation where there is no country or no industry on the continent that is producing vaccines at the moment? Are we just customers? Or can we also be producers of vaccines, um, if not now, if not in this pandemic, in future pandemics? That's one question. I also want to ask a question with respect to um, the Madagascar organic. We asked your colleague, uh, Professor Abdul Karim, about it. He thinks it's conspiracy. Do you also think it's mere conspiracy? Do you think we can have a synergy between traditional healing? the traditional healing system and biomedicine 
in a, in a situation like the COVID-19 pandemic. And if there is that kind of synergy, how do you think as an expert, how do you think we can facilitate that kind of uh, synergy? Then also, I, I also want to know your position as regards to Lagos state's relationship with other states. Um, we are not safe in Lagos until everyone is safe. If there are problems with testing, there are problems with um, adequate facilities in, 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 in Lagos, I mean, other states, don't you think that can undermine the kinds of work you are doing in your ministry if those kinds of things are not also ongoing there? So I really want to understand your relationship with other states. So we wanted to answer this question first, then we will go to the Q&A section. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Adetiba, you asked some very hard questions. <laughs> All right. uh, let, me, let me address the vaccine situation first. Um, so uh, in principle, I think this is a wake up call for us as Africans um, that you know, we've ignored this space. You don't just wake up one day and start producing vaccines. Uh, it's a systemic approach. It's an institutional uh, progressive capacity for biological innovation. Uh, it starts with, you know, clinical research. It starts with the ability to store samples and data. It starts with collaborations and it gr gradually progresses to your biotechnology capacity. Uh, I'm very happy to see my colleague, my senior colleague, Professor Salako on the phone and uh, on the call. I think, you know, he and, uh, and others, uh, we've been fighting this battle for a long time, not just in Nigeria, but across the continent, that we own our space. Um, we, we put enough resources into biotechnology research and development so that we can understand our own disease entities and develop our own biotechnology capacity. But it hasn't been a very successful campaign uh, to convince governments to put significant amount of money into indigenous research and development. And even at the Nigerian Institute for Medical Research, where Professor Salako is the director general, they used to produce vaccines there. We used to produce vaccines in VOM. Um, you know, there was a lot of research in Ibadan. Um, but, you know, we've lost it all, you know, and that really is the story across the continent of Africa. And, you know, all of a sudden now, you know, you think that we can wake up and start producing vaccines. It's not going to happen. You know, um, we've got to go back to the drawing board. Um, I'm now in government, so uh, I mean, I'm speaking to myself, but I wasn't always in government. Uh, we, were, we were always advocating to government, you know, that we can't always rely on foreign foreign uh, funding for our research because, you know, uh, foreign funding comes with significant uh, issues um, and our governments should be putting money into indigenous research. I think South Africa is doing a lot better than most countries um, and Nigeria being a big country on the continent, an important country, I think should also start to follow suit and to try and drive more, um, more resources towards research. Um, in Lagos State, we're trying to adopt that, you know, um, advocating that we put money into research, local research, we build our own technology, we build our own scientists, and we'll be in a stronger position to collaborate on a, on a fair and level playing field with the rest of the world. Understanding that data and samples are the beginning of um, our sovereignty and that we take control of our data and our samples and we um, um, participate in the global research arena on square terms. But now we have this situation where we have vaccines that are not produced on the continent, at least not um, traditionally. Um, so, you know, the countries that are really under a lot of pressure um, for to save lives, obviously, you know, as global citizens, we should be reasonable and, you know, if we are not seeing lots of deaths in this part of the world. Um, and there are a thousand times more deaths in India and Brazil, then it's only fair that those countries are able to at least achieve some degree of herd immunity uh, before 
we uh, access those vaccines. But, you know, they produce the vaccines, so they're only going to give us the excess. Um, uh, and, and so we've got to do with the excess, you know, um, and whatever is in excess is what we will have access to. Um, the COVAX and other such like um, organizations are trying to um, introduce, you know, global social um, social justice into the whole equation and kudos and credit to them. As a result of that, we've been able to uh, acquire some vaccines in Nigeria. But, you know, what we're learning now with COVID is that the whole world needs to move together. You cannot have one part of the world vaccinating up to 50% and 60% and places in Africa are still at 1% because that only allows the virus to circulate in that part of the world that is not achieving herd immunity. Mutations develop and then they threaten, they be, we become a biosecurity threat to the rest of the world. So I think it's important that the whole world understands that it's not just a case of, of, of social justice, it's a case of global biosecurity. Because you can vaccinate as much as you want in England and America, but if a mutant is developing in India or in Africa, and there's movement between England and Africa to these places that have high levels of vaccination, the mutations those vaccinations, remember, we are vaccinating against COVID-19. We are now in COVID-21. You know, the virus does not look the same as COVID-19. It's developed because of its ability to move through people very quickly, trying to avoid the immune system as it moves through every, um, every single individual. It's acquiring mutations that is allowing it to become a better pathogen. Um, it's debatable what a better pathogen is. Um, it could be actually a milder a version or a more virulent version. It depends. You know, the interaction between the viral nucleic acid and the human nucleic acid, whoever wins that battle um, is, is the victor. So I agree, you know, we need to up our game on the continent. Uh, in the meantime, we need to look at COVID as a global phenomenon. It's, you can't have disparate vaccination strategies. The world should understand that you can vaccinate as much as you want uh, in one part of the world, but if you leave the other part of the world out of it, um, you, you are just setting up a biosecurity threat for yourself. So in Lagos, we are obviously you know, following the federal strategy very carefully and very closely. Um, uh, Lagos State is a mega city. I think Lagos is needs to be uh, managed uh, in, you know, it's not one cap fits all, you know, every state in Nigeria is different, you know, and, you know, Lagos, because of its vulnerability needs a more aggressive strategy. And of course, you know, the governor is having conversations with federal government, you know, that, you know, we've only been able to achieve up less than 1% of first dose vaccination, whereas our target is 60%. So we need we need something else in Lagos if we're going to follow the global trend of, of, of upping our vaccination numbers to achieve that magic number of, of 50 to 60% herd immunity. So, um, you know, we the conversations have been had, you know, what is Lagos going to do? How is Lagos going to acquire the number of vaccines it requires to, to reach that level of herd immunity, which would mitigate a third wave for us here uh, in our mega city. Um, the issue around um, traditional medicine. So Lagos is very, very aggressive around um, exploring alternative therapies. We have a traditional medicine board. It has a, a, its own uh, building. It has its own board. Uh, we're plowing a lot of funds into trying to find indigenous solutions using uh, herbal and other kinds of natural therapies. Even within the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research is a whole unit that is dedicated towards finding um, um, alternative natural therapies. So this, the federal government is, is focused, the state government is focused on alternative medicines. But I must say that, you know, while we are encouraging traditional medicine, which is very popular in this part of the world, you know, most people will 
um, will consult a traditional herbalist before they come to us conventional medical therapists. Um, we, we must be in a position to regulate what this um, sector of our health fraternity are doing. So it's not okay to just put things together in a concoction. You don't do the toxicology, you don't do any clinical trials, um, and you just say ad hoc, um, it's, it's useful. No, we, you must go through the same processes and procedures that we use in modern medicine to go through phased clinical trials to establish the utility of, of these um, concoctions. You know, as medical practitioners, whether you're conventional or alternative, our motto is to do no harm first. So if you are trying to treat something and yet you're, you're causing kidney failure or liver failure or bone marrow shutdown, you know, that's not a solution, you know. So we must be very careful um, and when what we keep telling our traditional medicine colleagues is that you must go through the same robust um, processes and procedures to ensure that you can prove that whatever you are um, putting out there has is not toxic and uh, has advantage over alternative um, or preceding medical therapy. So we're very serious about it to answer your question. Again, it needs research and development. It needs a lot of money. Um, we also must make sure that we are not destroying our ecosystem, which is where these natural therapies come from. And by virtue of what's happening in Nigeria and across West Africa, we are destroying our forests and our ecosystems. And I don't know where we're going to find our traditional herbal therapies that our ancestors used because the ecosystem just can't accommodate them anymore. So. This is a very serious issue for us here in Nigeria that we are able to restore some of our ecosystems and go back to our ancient um, traditions and find what our ancestors used to treat uh, conditions, just like is happening in China and in India. They've preserved their ancestral therapies and they've made them into very elaborate um, and very um, um, uh, effective uh, treatment strategies, and we need to do the same thing here. Um, you are talking about Lagos State in respect of other states. So yes, um, a good example, it's, it's a yes and a no. Uh, so on the yes side, uh, we have been collaborating very closely with our neighbors, our immediate neighbors, and at the beginning, we worked very closely across the country trying to standardize and um, provide a uniform uh, infrastructural upgrade strategy. Uh, Ogun State and Lagos State, which are very close to each other and almost contiguous. Um, so you can't, there are many parts of Lagos that just blend into Ogun State. Many people live in Ogun State and work in Lagos and vice versa. So we see ourselves as one state um, or one geo geological entity. Uh, and if you recall, the first index case was in Ogun State, and we work very closely with the Ogun State Commissioner of Health uh, to bring that patient to Lagos uh, because we had slightly better infrastructure and capacity and were able to arrest that first index case. So there was no spread from that index case that the Italian gentleman that came into, into Lagos and Ogun State. But subsequently, of course, uh, multiple index cases came into Lagos and we moved from imported cases to trans community transmission. But you're absolutely right. Uh, there's not enough collaboration between the states. If Lagos State is doing well, it's at its own peril um, not to take other states along with it. Um, but I think there are other states that are doing equally well, states like Kaduna, the central federal uh, capital territory, uh, some states in the south-south, you know, or your state, you know. So I think, you know, the, the answer to your question is, no, we're not doing enough interstate collaboration. Um, and yes, you know, um, the states that are doing well should be cognizant of the fact that you cannot, um, you cannot uh, singularly um, be successful if you don't take your neighbors along with it. Uh, but we leave that to uh, the federal government to take the lead through its institutions, the Nigerian Center for Disease Control. 
and um, the Nigerian Institute of Medical Research to pull the states together and to help us because while we're busy trying to solve our problems in our states, you know, there needs to be some effort to uh, cooperate and collaborate, share and disseminate information and best practices. What has worked in your state and what has not worked? Uh, these are key, key uh, issues um, in terms of uh, national and sub-regional collaboration. We're working very closely with the West African Health Authority to see if we can uh, develop a standard for uh, the West African, the 15 or 16 countries in the West African region to develop uniform policies and strategies uh, that uh, we can um, standardize our samples, standardize our data, standardize our biosecurity strategies and drive a process where we're all moving together um, in a synchronized and harmonized fashion. Thank you very much. Thank you very Thank much. You very much. <laughs> Thank you very much, Prof. Um, we appreciate you for answering that, those questions. Um, we have um, other questions, but I understand you you have a very tight schedule this morning. So, but but I know I know subsequently we can always call on you, and we do know you will respond to our call when that comes up. Uh, we want to appreciate you, and um, the director of the center will get across to you, Prof. And we hope very subsequently you can also intervene in an ongoing book project that we have here at the center these kinds of the kinds of ideas you have brought to fall in, in, on this panel is important to to it's important we crisscross these ideas with our colleagues in the social sciences and in the humanities and that is why this platform is a very important platform it is not a platform of scientists it's a platform of social scientists and humanities who also raise very cogent issues that are not altogether scientific issues but are critical issues so to say so we appreciate you prof we do yeah. hope to always see you in the nearest future thank you so much all the best thank, prof. You. thank you very much and greetings to all my colleagues and thank you for the opportunity That's appreciate prof. yes prof so, um, so colleagues, um, we we have come to the end of the first um, panel this morning. Unfortunately, Professor Abdukarim could not come back because of his engagement. We have the second panel later in the afternoon by two we are going to be hearing from we will have an ngo perspective to the covid 19 pandemic and we hope to hear from um a resource person um from osisa and and we hope this section like the ones we've had will be very interesting and quite intriguing we appreciate you so much um those questions that, that have been asked i will do well to send some of these questions to to our speakers if answers can be provided we will communicate subsequently thank you so much enjoy the afternoon yes we will come back to 2 p.m 1 p.m nigerian time 2 p.m south african time and there we have mrs Car caroline who will be talking from an ngo perspective thank you